This video will be a little bit of a departure from the topic of theology proper, although it does, in some way, involve religion. Today we'll be talking about the making of the modern Middle East, specifically the Arab countries to the north of the peninsula, and the reality of Islam within these countries. I'm going to give you a quote from a renowned author, a Maronite Christian living in the time when the Ottoman Empire was at its collapse. His name was Amin al-Rihani. He wrote, They want to divide us in pursuit of total Western hegemony until our nationalism is dead. They have created in this day and age Pharaohism for Egypt, Phoenicianism for Lebanon, Berberism for Morocco. Why are we Arabs today identifying with people that we didn't even know existed a few decades ago, that we have nothing in common with, he writes. This is a disgrace. People of North Africa today are Arabs. They speak Arabic and they recite the Quran. I have another quote from you, from a sheikh that he met from northern Syria. He says, and he was the paramount chief of the Shamar tribe of Iraq. Beyond our boundaries, which are in reality only tribal, there is, we are told, water and pasture. But there is the Syrian desert, here the desert of Iraq, divisions to strangle the Arabs. By the light of these stars, lifting his face and his hands up to heaven, he says, what I say is true. The desert is one, and it knows nor Syria nor Iraq. It knows only the Arabs. The desert is the land of the Arabs. What right have the Europeans or other foreigners in it? But the Europeans come here with the unfathomable presumption and with intentions that cannot be concealed. The League of Nations commissions to define the northwestern boundaries between Iraq and Syria was then in Mosul. They come here, I say, commissioned by their own governments, not ours, to divide our country, our desert. There it is. You behold it in all its vacancies. It is all we have. And it is neither Syrian nor Iraqi, I say again, nor by Allah, European. It is Arabian. It belongs to the Arabs. The writer Amin al-Rihani, when describing his relationship with his sheikh and his own opinion on the so-called nationalism of many different nations within the Middle East today, speaks about a subject that is often overlooked. It is customary when discussing the conquest of the Middle East by Western powers in the post-Ottoman period for people to assume that it is the Gulf nations of Arabia, so Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Kuwait, Qatar, UAE, Oman, to a lesser extent Yemen if you would include them in this Arabian circle, and perhaps Jordan as well. But if we remove Jordan and Yemen, it is the wealthy GCC nations that are always accused of being the Western stooge. And yet if you actually read on your history, such as the quotes I had given you, or the result of all of these other nations north of the peninsula, you'll see that the exact opposite case is true. This is where theology will come into play, so please stay tuned. When we look at Egypt, for example, we see an enormously overpopulated country, especially when you take a look here at the actual population density of this nation. Even though it looks quite large, it's larger than Syria or Iraq, nobody lives in most of the country. They only live in the Nile Delta, along the river, and of course in the north, where there's fertile land. So with a population of almost 120 million, this is a massive country in terms of its people. And Egypt has a fascinating reputation in the minds of many Christians, for example. Too often, Arab Christians, whether they're properly Arab or other ethnicities like the Copts who are native to Egypt, learn of Egypt or talk of Egypt, they're always talking about the persecution done presumably by the uneducated swaths of Muslims who are in more poor areas and hold more hatred and sectarian points of views. And so from that, there is then a gross over-exaggeration that Egypt is this extremely fundamentalist Islamic nation. I'm going to do, debunk that entirely. When you actually take a look at Egypt, the government can treat the Christians like garbage. This is not all to do with Islamic theology. The country of Egypt is actually filled with a lot of people who are pagan adjacent. This may, can, this may come to you as a, quite a shocking accusation from Jim, the diaspora Arab Christian YouTuber, but it is actually true. If you take a look at all of the monuments in Egypt, 
particularly if you look at Alexandria, there are no more Egyptian idols in this land. Why? Because this is a land that was ruled entirely and the heart of Christian apologetics and theology. And so the Christians absolutely annihilated every idol they could get their hands on. The same applies to the early Orthodox in Greece. In fact, when Islam came, they were less harsh on the idols that were within the land of Egypt. We're not going to talk about medieval Egypt today, where the solid identity of Arab and Islamic was actually at its height, but rather in today's modern Egypt, as I said, in the post-Ottoman period. We can see that it is Egyptian Muslims, alongside Christians who are proud of their pre-Muslim, pre-Abrahamic identity, in that they are proud of the pharaohs, they are proud of the idols, and they are proud of the monuments. I've had so many discussions with Islamists from Egypt, and we'll get to the Islamists in just a moment, but during these discussions, I would always talk to them about Christianity and what changed when Islam came over. And they would always say, it was your Coptic cousins who destroyed all of the Egyptian monuments and idols. We, the Muslims, preserved them. I believe he thought this was an actual argument, but speaking theologically, it makes no sense. Islam is supposed to be a hardcore monotheist religion, more iconoclast than anything in Christianity. And yet, there was a Muslim Egyptian calling himself an Islamist, who is defending the idols of Egypt from the ancient Copts, who, by the way, would have been his own ancestors. And so in Egypt every year, you'll also see these massive parades held by the government in honor of their ancient gods, their ancient pharaohs, their ancient civilization. If you speak to Egyptians in any of their historical museums, they will deny that the Israelites were ever enslaved. They will deny that there is even a record of Moses in this land. They will deny anything that sounds even close to the standard of narrative in the Bible or in the Quran. So it's not as if the Quran is this book that takes place in the Indus Valley River and is totally disattached from the Abrahamic story. The story of Moses and the Israelites is still integral to the Quranic narrative, and yet here you have Egyptians wholesale throwing it into the garbage in order to preserve their Egyptian identity. This is not a seldom occurrence. Again, I have to point out, the poorer, less educated people will be more in tune with the actual tenets of the Islamic religion, i.e. they will not care that much about Egyptian paganism before their time. But it is the educated, perhaps the top 30% of the country, which this is still 30 million people in this nation, who would put their Egyptian identity before the religion of Islam. This is supposed to be the largest Arab Muslim country in the entire world, and yet a large portion of them seem to care more about their Egyptian identity. If you go to Tunisia, it's even worse. In Tunisia, there is this massive care for a pre-Islamic identity, and the law is hardly even based on the Sharia system at all anymore. In fact, they recently secularized the constitution to state that Tunisia has no set religion, and that there is complete freedom of religion. This is a 99% Sunni Muslim country, by the way. And this is common throughout all of these nations. In Lebanon, everybody knows about the infamous Phoenicianism, but we'll let that slide for now because the topic of this discussion is Islam, and it was mainly Christians who cared that much about the Phoenicianism. If we look at the Palestinians, it's the exact same story. I've talked to so many Palestinians when they really get into a big argument and they're talking about the, uh, they're talking about the Israelis, the Jews, they'll drop Islam as a religion in terms of arguing properly, and they'll simply say, oh, we're the natives, we're the native indigenous Canaanites. What kind of an example is that? Well, why are we now identifying as indigenous Canaanites? I thought you were proud Palestinian Muslims. It doesn't make any sense. If you look at the Gaza Strip, however they seem to govern it, there is actually no compulsion to wear hijab at all. Same applies to most of the West Bank. Even in Egypt, it is socially customary to wear the hijab, but there are women who do not. And this brings me to a greater point overall, beyond just the accusation of paganism and the accusation of idolizing one's ancient past, which of course there are many Christian nations who do so. However, I want to focus on one thing that is a huge problem in the Arab world that nobody is discussing, and that is secularism and democracy. It is often stated that the Muslim world, specifically the Arab world, is this extremely fundamentalist, supra-traditionalist, insane, fanatically religious region, and that could not be further from the truth. Every single one of the Arab nations is a secularized nation in one way or another, except for the ones in the peninsula. And the point of this video is actually to point out that the ones in the peninsula, or the Arab Gulf countries as we call them, are the least destroyed by Western ideologies, 
compared to all of the other nations. It's not even a contest. Simply take a look at how they dress. All the politicians from the Arabian Gulf, all these Gulf nations, the wealthy ones, they all dress in tribal garb. You'll see that in every instance, the politicians from these countries dress as if they just walked out of an Arabian village 250 years ago. But look at the politicians from Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Iraq, even Yemen, Palestine as well. None of them wear tribal clothing. They put on the suit, the tie, they're clean shaven, they're wearing Western products, they use Western medicine, they speak like Westerners even when they speak in Arabic. Even in Egypt, which is called this fundamentalist, crazy, super-religious area, which, of course, there are parts of Egypt who are like that. But the top government, what is it? Look at Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. He wears a suit and a tie. You may say, okay, okay, but what about uh, Morsi, the one before him, who was the Islamist? Surely he dressed in tribal garb. Not so. He also wore a suit and a tie. <laughs> All of them wear a suit and a tie. The Islamist position is not one of actual Sharia law. It is not one that is hardcore Islamic system. It is an Islamized version of secular democracy. I've had so many debates with Islamists from Egypt, like the one I mentioned earlier, who had defended the idols within Egypt. Rather than just the idols, their entire mannerism of talking is liberal and secularized. Their talking points, they sound like they're woke liberals from New York City or Los Angeles, except with an Islamic veneer. The way they speak about Christians, they wield words like colonialism, bigotry, xenophobia. You would think you're talking to a liberal from Europe or America. The fact that Muslims even partake in democracy and secularism is a fact that all of these nations have been totally conquered. They just happen to have an Islamic lens. Even Saddam Hussein, who is one of the most infamous and for some reason oft mentioned people on discord and other parts of the internet people westerners have a fetish for saddam hussein saddam hussein uh revived himself the ancient iraqi heritage in mesopotamia he praised nebuchadnezzar okay he, he praised all of his religion he fancied himself as a defender of the arabs while simultaneously wanting to restore iraqi monuments now am i against the restoration of ancient culture no but there's a fine line, and that line is pure idolatry. Keeping a building like the pyramids is acceptable. I'm not arguing against that. Perhaps even the ziggurat of Ur is acceptable because it is just a building. But this is not just the buildings we're talking about. We're talking about statues, carved images of ancient gods and ancient god men who opposed the monotheistic god of the Israelites. The Egyptians are the number one pagans mentioned in the Torah the enemies of the Israelites, and modern Egyptians will bend over backwards, they'll throw Moses, they'll throw all the Israelites into the garbage, thus destroying their entire theological system and their whole religion just to defend Egypt. Oh, we Egyptians, we didn't enslave the Israelites, we don't have Moses, as I stated before. I've had so many conversations with Egyptians that end like that. Palestinians the same way, we're the native indigenous Canaanites. No, they're not. I'm sorry, Palestinians are not 100% pure indigenous Canaanite. They have a substantial amount of Arabian ancestry and a substantial amount of Israelite ancestry, which they should be proud of both. No, there is no more Canaanite ancient identity. It's gone, it's dead. So you can choose to identify as uh, the descendant of the Israelites, the descendant of the Arabians, or a mix of both, which is what a lot of Palestinians are. The same applies to so many other Arabs, Syrians, Jordanians, Lebanese, mostly Ishmaelite with some Israelite ancestry. Probably a little more Israelite ancestry the closer you go to the coast and away from the desert. The point is, why are we identifying as ancient Canaanites? There's no reason. Amin al-Rihani was correct. Look at how the politicians in all these nations dress, as I said before. Morocco to Egypt, all the way even to Jordan, which claims to be this tribal nation. The king of Jordan dresses in suits most of the time when he speaks to a Westerner. Okay, he may, he may put on a kefir, shemak, but he's not, going to, he's not going to change into tribal garb most of the time. He acts as a Westerner. The government acts as Western governments. If you ignore Syria, which is run by an Alawite government, which is not a good example because we're talking about Sunni Islam here, look even at Egypt, the way they treat Islamists. And this was before Abdel Fattah al-Sisi was there. Okay? Look at Jordan, the way they treat Islamists. Look at Iraq. Okay? The leaders of Iraq, the Sunnis, 
were all secularized. It was only after the war that they turned to religious fanaticism to get their revenge on the Western forces, on the Shia, and other minorities, and tried to unify themselves with Syria and other Arab nations. So they did it via religion, and it failed. Even Yemen, as poor as it is, as religious as it may seem, is run at the top by men in suits. All of the nations except for the Gulf nations are run by men in suits. All of the nations except for the Gulf nations are secular democracies with an Islamic veneer. So, to those who say it is Saudi, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, UAE, Oman, these are the ones who are destroyed by the West? I think not. I think they partnered with the West in a wise manner. They made a lot of money off of it. I don't support any of their governments, nor do I really care to not support them either. I'm completely neutral. don't really care what the Arabian Gulf countries do. But for the purpose of this video, it is clear they are the victors of the post-Ottoman period, and not just in terms of wealth, but in terms of culture. If you want a glimpse of traditional Arab culture, you'll have to go to the Gulf or go to one of these rural villages in Syria or Iraq where people still actually live the tribal life. By the way, tribal is not the same word as Bedouin. There are Bedouin and they are nomadic. And then there are also tribal Arabs who dress as a Saudi would dress, mainly. But they're not really Bedouin. They may move around a little bit during the year, but they have a settled village and a settled life. Even most Saudis cannot say that they are all Bedouin. A lot of them come from settled village Arabs. Even the founder of Saudi Arabia was not a Bedouin. Ibn Saud, he was a, a settled village Arab. Anyway, that was the point of this video, that the, the Islamic Arab East is not this super fundamentalist area. It is conservative, yes. The people are not you know, hippies and pacifists like a lot of the, the liberals in the West are. They don't hate their own heritage. And the contrary, it's the other way around. They don't care for their modern Islamic heritage and are trying to go back to some ancient one. An ancient one that 100 years ago they, they had no idea what it even was, to be totally honest. And so I find it very unconvincing that all of these Arab nations have preserved the sanctity of Islam when Islam is practiced differently in all of them. In Tunisia, sometimes people drink. In Egypt, being a Muslim means you're just not a Coptic Christian. But other than that, there's no distinction because both of them care a lot about their pre-Abrahamic Egyptian identity, which has nothing to do with the religion of the Bible or the Quran. Okay? So that's what the purpose of this video was. I hope everybody even if you're not familiar with the Middle East, has a vague understanding now of what I'm talking about. It's not just Turkey and Azerbaijan who are these secularized nations. They're more secular on the outside, for sure, and probably more secular on the inside. But all the northern Arab countries are secular democracies. I'm going to repeat it again. Islamism is not diametrically opposed to democracy. It is democracy with an Islamic lens. That's all it is, and that's all it will ever be. Islamism is not the full-scale Quranic, Hadith, Sharia law that is prescribed in the actual theology of Islam. None of these nations follow it properly, save for the ones who are in the Arabian Gulf. Thank you for watching.